feels like everyone in our community at AI Makerspace is either trying to get hired or do some hiring. Whether you're an AI engineer or an AI engineering leader, there has really never been a more exciting time to be in the game. Welcome to the state of AI engineering jobs in 2024. We've got a special event today. I'm Dr. Greg, co-founder and CEO of AI Makerspace, and I'll be joined throughout today's event by a number of special guests, including, of course, The Wiz, our CTO at AI Makerspace, but also some community members as well as hiring partners. During this event, we'll talk about the state of AI jobs, the proliferation of AI jobs across even new cities, new geographies. We'll talk about the AIV League and if that's really a thing. We'll touch on remote work versus going back in person. And we will hear from actual job seekers that have achieved their goals. And we'll hear their success stories. Hopefully we can come up with some best practices and some context on what this space actually looks and feels like heading into the spring. If you have questions, today's gonna to be a little bit more interactive and a little less coding than usual. So please drop them in Slido for the official Q&A at the end, but also feel free to drop them directly into the YouTube live chat if you have questions for us or if you have questions for any of our speakers. All right, let's get into it. Without further ado, we're going to give this entire discussion some context. I want to first invite our number one guest of the day, co-founder of Future Path AI and a hiring partner of AI Makerspace for folks coming out of our boot camp, Marudi Agarwal. Marudi, thanks for joining us today, man. I know you're seeing a lot of hiring taking place across Fortune 500, Fortune 100, and even beyond companies. Can you tell us a little bit about what the hiring landscape looks like from your perspective? Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. Is this, is this something that like people are struggling with everywhere? Um, what does it take to hire the right person today in spring 2024? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so one thing I will say, you know, uh, Personally, when I go out to hire, I'm looking for people in AI, but I'm also speaking with people who are in the more traditional software engineers who are learning AI skills and then they are looking for a job, they are interviewing and now what feedback they are coming back with. So one thing consistently, you know, from my interactions, conversations with enterprises, and especially I'm talking about North America, a lot of conversations I'm having are Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 North America enterprises. Um, so. This is an actual conversation from, from one of the large and, uh, largest enterprise that one of their stakeholders said, I have been allocated $15 million budget to do something in generative AI, and I have to use that within next one year. So what could we do with it? Uh, that So I'm telling you the mindset of the enterprises. Mm -hmm. They have absolute pressure from their board, from their board of directors, from their stakeholders, that we are supposed to do things in generative AI. Go figure it out. And this is the money spend it. That's right. right. So the jobs and generative AI is going to explode this year. I do not doubt that for a, for, for a moment. And even even non data science jobs, even software engineers, they are starting to see in interviews that people are talking about what experience you have with prompting. Have you used different models? So even a software engineer who's not interested in getting into AI, so at the way we are heading towards these things, it will become just in it inevitably important for everybody to have at least basic understanding of workable knowledge of the things that ha are happening in AI. So sort of people need to start focusing on upskilling themselves. Uh, you're just just uh, at a very high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I heard from another uh, person who's a consultant at a large, large technology consulting firm recently that sort of 2023 was kind of the year of education and yes this is the year that it's like the board pressure is real people yes. need to figure out how to get the talent into their organization and the easiest way to do that fundamentally is hiring right yeah. and so when you 
are working with these companies, are they valuing kind of more of the software engineering skill set, more of the data science skill set, or are they really looking for those brand new tooling skill sets that kind of exists at that open source edge? Oh, uh, all across the paradigm, right? They are looking for software engineers who are comfortable with these new skills. They are looking for uh, ML engineers, data scientists who are good at these things. They understand, you know, how to go about using this, which is uh, which is a hard problem because it's still a very new skill set. Uh, I want to speak a little bit on the earlier point. This is absolutely spot on. Yes, the last year, and I was there right there. So I have I've seen this up close uh, in more than 10 cases. Last year, when enterprises, stakeholders were educating themselves. So they were doing small POCs with a smaller budget to you know, test the waters. And now they're expanding on it and they're converting into bigger projects, right? And that, that is where the hiring really comes in the picture because now they figured out the use cases they want to go after. They even figured out, uh, you know, that, that's the maturity I'm seeing from last three months. When I was having conversations in December, people were still trying to figure things out. Now enterprises are coming saying, Oh, we have decided we are going to use Azure OpenAI. We have decided we are going to use Anthro, you know, uh, uh, Bedrock AWS. We have decided we are going to use Anthropic. So they are ahead in their journey now. They've figured out the use cases they're going to go after. They have figured out the infrastructure. They need people to start executing now. And that is why I'm saying the time for jobs in Gen AI is, is I can see it right there, uh, you know, mm. with the progress mm. that is happening. Yeah, so it's so interesting, right? Because on one hand, we have this large narrative of this job apocalypse, of this job loss that's been happening over the last number of years that will continue to now sort of accelerate and evolve. And this is sort of the first kind of reference material we're gonna put in the chat today, this state of AI jobs link that we'll throw in here. This is something that we've been tracking for a number of years. Are you hearing anything from enterprises today about like concerns of job loss? Is this really a focus area in these in these firms you're talking? To? It seems like it's the complete opposite. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I mean, uh, if people are looking for jobs in AI, uh, yes, you can you can talk to me for that. There are there are plenty of jobs. So uh, I'm not really seeing, and I'm constantly hiring people too. <laughs> Pretty much every one one every ten days, I'm hiring somebody. So I, I'm not seeing really job loss from on my side of the world. And I would again repeat, you know, whatever was happening two three years ago, don't get bogged down by that. Uh, focus on the opportunity opportunities which are right there and you and and, and you are you know you it seems sounds like you guys are already on to right things so keep doing that uh, because uh, it's it's a new wave of jobs where people will ask you questions about your experience in generative right this is going this is happening now mm. uh, so you, it's on you to choose whether you want to be a part of that or not yeah 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 absolutely yeah it seems like on one hand we have there's massive job loss concerns but on the other hand it's like well, AI is actually creating a ton of jobs. And it seems like that yeah. is where, you know, kind of if you're in this industry looking for jobs at this edge, that's where you are sitting. Yeah. The job loss thing is is really in a different part of the workforce. It's not at the yeah. edge. It's not with people picking up the technology tools and learning them, yeah. listening to this channel or that Absolutely. you're hiring every 10 days, right? Um, Absolutely. So, so like one of the things that's happening geographically, it seems like, is there's this proliferation of AI jobs from outside of the typical cities. Uh, and this is sort of connected to remote work a little bit. This is, our, this is our sort of next kind of reference material we want to throw into the chat here. Like, I know you have a view of North America <coughs> in general that you're sort of thinking about all the time. Are you seeing that, you know, the AI jobs are moving out of, let's say, Silicon Valley at all? They're, they're starting to pick up in other cities beyond just like New York or Boston. Um, what's happening in, in Canada? So, is remote work still OK? What, what's your perspective on this? It is still very company specific. But it, now it's, it's, it's my gut feel that for the AI job, the talent is going to be so scarce that company will go for good people wherever they find them because they won't have the luxury of having good people living next to their office. They won't. So, and they will need, you know, work, they will need to get work done, right? They, they, they have pressure now. So with stakeholders have pressure now to deliver. With every passing quarters, they have to go and respond back to their board. And we are seeing that happening now. 
So I don't think uh, even if companies are saying, uh, you know, we are not remote, they will hire AI folks remote as well. They have to. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. So the, the last uh, the last sort of piece of this that I want to discuss with you is there's this idea of sort of this new prestige coming in with AI experience, this sort of AI V league, as people call it now. And, it, and you know, so I'm curious, like, and I, and I get this sort of question from, you know, I work at a in sort of a military town myself in Dayton, Ohio. I get this question a lot is like, what what is what is the value of like a degree these days? What exactly is valued? Is it experience <laughs> from a particular company? Is it experience in the particular industry? Is it a specific degree, whether that's a bachelor's, master's, or PhD. How are you triaging people that apply to your companies and that work for your uh, your your customers as consultants? That, 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 that's, a, that's a very, very good question. So I, I can, I mean, I've been hiring in AI for 15 years, all right? Uh, so I, I've hired, I've interviewed a few hundred people, at least on the lower spectrum, I would say, especially for AI, ML, computer vision, and NLP for, for these roles, right? So the things that I strictly look for, I do not care about your titles. I do not care about your experience. I, I straight away go for projects. And if I'm seeing those cookie cutter projects, you know, Twitter sentiment classification and all, I know you, you downloaded it from Git and just ran the code. I'm not going to care about that. I look for projects where you actually did something. And if I can see you did something where you made a decision of I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it this way, then I'm interested in talking to you. Those are the straight I, I, I go for. I do not care about anything else. To be honest, your college, your your grades, uh, your certifications. I more than that, I'll see what is there in your CV, what work you did. Love it so much. Yeah, that's and that's completely aligned. I think with everything that that we try to push forward at AI Makerspace. Right? If if you're building things, if you're sharing them, if you're telling the stories Absolutely. about what you built, you're going to be in a great. Absolutely. Spot. Absolutely. I'll tell you my favorite interview question. Also, you know, if you happen to interview with me. I'm going to ask you, what's your favorite project? And I'll say, I start talking about it. And I'll listen to everything you have to say. So Ooh. I'm not going to ask you a question from my book, which you, you might not know. I'll ask you things that you do know, just to stand your ground on that. Mm, mm, mm. Now, just on that point, like I, I get a lot of people coming to us saying, hey, well, I feel like, you know, I need to study data structures and algorithms more. I need to I need to go into uh, this or that and understand the attention layer better. Um, <laughs> and, and there may be jobs, as we tell folks, that you have to do that for. It's not going to be <clears throat> the thing that you have that you do on the job, but you you have to sort of like check this box on some of these. This jobs. is a very, very good and very relevant question. So I want to be very careful of how I answer it, right? Yeah. So with a disclaimer, I'm not discouraging anybody from studying anything, right? Data structure is absolutely great. I love it. Yes, go ahead and read it. It is my, so it, I, I, again, take it with a pinch of salt. I don't want to tell people don't study this. That is a very dangerous thing to say, right? <laughs> but the time uh, I, what i see is the for the product builders right understanding what technology to use and how to use is what is going to get very very important and i'll stop at that because it's a very very thin line you know fine line to cross mm. so uh, a lot of companies might not go as deep into this. certain type of companies will uh, but they will talk more about what are you capable of building and what you have built in the past I, I feel that is going to be the single most important question as we go, keep going deeper uh, into this Gen AI day. Okay, fire alarm at my house. Probably some cooking. All right. Well, thank you so much, Marudi. We appreciate your insights today, and uh, and I want to go ahead and uh, welcome the Wiz up to the stage. Um, Chris, thanks for joining us, dude. Um, what's your take on this AI V League thing? I know this is something that we we get a lot of questions about this idea of what should I be studying next? Do I need to do data structures and algorithms? Do I need to do this or that? I mean, and it is it is a nuanced thing, right? Because like, yeah, you kind of do, but you kind of don't too. Um, and then we'll hear from a, a couple of folks in our community soon. We'll see if they actually had to deal with this in their particular interview process. But in general, what's your advice? Yeah, I mean, 
basically as much as you can when it comes to these kinds of you know uh processes and what you should learn what you should focus on learning i mean uh right now we're in a very build forward practical uh i think you know uh part of the job cycle uh, people are last year we did a lot of like cool you know iterating and cool research and learning cool new ideas and this year it seems like it's all about like building those things, uh, building them many times over um, and in many different ways. So as for what you should focus on learning, I do think that there's, you know, some compulsory stuff that we're I'm sure we're going to touch on throughout the, uh, the the rest of the thing. You know, you have to learn the handshake. This is how I've heard it described to me. And I just love that that verbiage. So I'll repeat it every time. And there is some handshakes that are, uh, you know, unique to this space. Right. Talking about like what what is you know a transformer what are llms these mm. kinds of kind of uh really high level questions just to show that you you've, you've done your research right uh dsa doesn't seem to be disappearing from the interview um even though it, it's not it's it's never useful but again dsa is a handshake it's not a uh a way of life so yeah yeah Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, and um, and on that note, let's let's hear from a few folks within our community that have gone through this process recently. I want to welcome first up Laura Funderburk to the stage. She is known around here as Laura the Legend. She is a really enthusiastic community builder in the AI space. She's been building and sharing in developer advocate style roles for the past couple of years. And she's always out there creating written content, creating new codes to share, creating scalable end-to-end -end pipelines in Haystack and in other places. And she is getting really into, it seems like streaming data now as well. Um, Laura, welcome. I want to kind of kick it off with your story about your job search and particularly on this hiring point, like what did you have to go through specifically to actually land a job? And did you, did you get hung up on any of these like sort of data structures and algorithms kind of things along the way? Um, was it a really big challenge you had to overcome? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, well, you've had a chance to see me within the AI makerspace uh, building. I had a chance to to learn with you through the, I think first at Fourth Brain, and then later on through the AI makerspace LLM ops cohorts. So I think one of the things that I that I dedicated myself to do a lot is take a look at what what is what what are the new or emerging technologies. And I think I, I very closely identify with this philosophy of uh, build, ship, and share. So in terms of my journey towards developer advocacy, I, I started as a data scientist. And but within data science, I was I was always uh, very interested in organizing events and doing community outreach and doing meetups and all that. So I, I kind of found I, I get to have both in this in this role of developer advocacy. Um, and last year, I think I, I sort of spent my entire time learning how to build these rag pipelines. I think that's pretty much all I did during 2023. I just learned how to prompt LLMs with you, with the community. And, and then together we, we went from prompting LLMs all the way to building these systems that have an LLM attached to them. Um, so for last year, I think my focus within community outreach and community advocacy was more focused on deploying applications. So I would build a small rag pipeline and then I would add some kind of user interface and then, you know, package it, deploy it on the cloud and then share it with the community. And the opportunity to work with Bikewax came along um, around the same time that I was more on this focus. And this idea of ML ops and data ops has been on my, on I think my bigger passion for a long time where, and I, I think this is this is where, where there's the most opportunity when it comes to finding AI jobs is um, not so much on the building the shiny, cool applications, but rather building processes that, that can maintain and update and keep these applications running. So I've, I think I have more of a traditional background when it comes to data science, I think more in terms of batches and processing things in chunks. And so when the chance came to, to talk with with Bitewax about streaming, I was like, yes, I want to I want to I want to bring real time analytics to Rack. Um, I think I was very lucky 
and that I didn't have to, I didn't have to um, sort of fight a lot to, to find work. I think for me, it's more that I, I built, I ship and share, and I, I find communities that build, ship and share. And then through that opportunities open up to build, ship and share with others who also want to build, ship and share. So <laughs> yeah, I think that's my, my, my journey. Uh, amazing. So specifically, did you have any sort of interview style questions that are more academic in nature, that are more more like a, a computer science degree type test question? Did you have to deal with this really at all? Yes. Or yes. Yes, I did. Yeah, I did. So uh, I have I had a, a take home assignment yeah. and the take home assignment was more geared towards creating content. Um, and the skill that the take home assignment was going for was the ability to review documentation and build something new with it. And so I think, I think, I think that that question was very, very well presented because oftentimes, you know, you can go and memorize all these data structure concepts, but can you take that concept and turn it into something that somebody else can use for their use case? I think, I think that's, that's the, the, the thing. So I think for me, um, having spent time learning how these frameworks work really helped me get comfortable navigating API documentation and then building things based off of that API documentation. Mm. So instead of placing focus, I'm going to study all these data structures. I think I place focus more on understanding how systems work and how I can use them to build things that I wanted to build. Mm. Very cool. Very cool. Now, Wiz, we've got to, we've got to be honest with the audience here though. There's a reason why we called her Laura the Legend. I mean, she's always <laughs> been that good as long as we've known her, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it, it is the case that Laura uh, has been build, shipping, and sharing uh, since before we met Laura. I imagine she will continue to do so long after we are gone. That's uh, right. You know, it's uh, it's something that I think really speaks. I, I mean, Laura used the term luck, which I I think was a, uh, a, 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 listen, it, it might apply to some people, but I think, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you, you can create your own luck in this space uh, by, by kind of practicing some of the things that Laura just talked about. And it's, uh, you know, one of the, one of the ways that you, you might want to think about it. And, and this is like a full startup kind of, you know, uh, book terminology that I, again, just love the words, uh, in this order, right. Uh, Build shipping and sharing expands your luck surface, right? You have yes. more luck, uh, you know, you more more rolls of the dice, let's say, uh, when you build ship and share as much as someone like Laura did, and I think, I think that is key. The thing, the thing that I can expand upon, I think sharing is really important, and sharing in the context of a community is crucial because you can build and ship and and share you know sh sharing i think is a very broad term i think I, I was very intentional about communicating and broadcasting the kinds of things that i can build so curating my uh, online social media presence curating the kind of content that i that i that i write about but i think also finding a community that that also has that mentality because then then you, you start you start you start popping up in others feeds and others and others feeds pop up into yours that share that similar way of thinking um, I think finding ways to build the things that are important to you, I think has also been really helpful for me. I have what, what helps me is having a big sense of curiosity. Like I, I was very curious all of 2023 about these LLMs and building rag systems. And now I'm very curious about incorporating real time analytics. I want to build a real time rag. So now I'm like bag rags. So I think, I think this is where we're heading next and, uh, placing the focus on build ship and sharing. Yes, but also being very intentional about curating how we share and who we share it with is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Laura, you know, I think one of the things that's resonating uh, with me from Bowen's question in the chat is I think you have a lot of people's dream job, this sort of developer, developer advocacy kind of role. Um, Bowen asks like, how do you actually keep on building stuff and how do you share it too, without actually maybe having a front end on it? How, how are you doing this? I mean, one of the things I've noticed you're doing sometimes is you're actually getting a whole bunch of other people together and leading a new community effort, which yes. is a totally next level thing, but very important as a developer advocate. Maybe you can address uh, Bowen's question directly and give him some advice. Yes. So uh, Bowen, I think my focus when it comes to sharing is it doesn't have to be this grand thing, like this grand system, even small things like, hey, this week I learned about this. 
and I just spent time playing with a library. In my case, I spent all of 2023 playing with Haystack and Langchain. And so if I learned something about any of those, I would say, hey, I, I this to this week I learned that you could you could ask natural language questions programmatically using their their Serper wrappers, and then I can go and uh, so these these kinds of small things is what I mean by sharing. I don't I don't have to build this end to end system, and over time I think do, doing this on the regular, these small code snippets or these small ideas can over time build a habit. You know, one week you just share about, I learned about this topic and here's a mini code snippet. And then you keep doing that for four weeks and later on, oh, look, and later it's easier for you to put those pieces together into something more complex and say, hey, like I shared, I shared um, a, a GitHub repository with what was initially a code snippet of something that I discovered and it's now a complete script. And then, you know, four weeks go by and you want to add, I don't know, a user interface or you want to, you want to actually play with deploying it on a cloud, like Hugging Face, for example, or Plumer Cloud. And then you learn how to do that. So the way I, th I think of it is in terms of sharing my learning with others. Um, I agree that doing this in the context of a software engineering job is really challenging. And I think it's one of the reasons I've loved going into developer advocacy so, so much is because when I was a data scientist, I didn't have time to do this either. <laughs> I didn't have any time to do this at all. Uh, I was, again, uh, maybe luck, luck I think is one of those words. I, I, I went through a layoff back when I was a data scientist. Job market got tough. Um, but then I, I, because I had all this experience or I, I was very eager to find ways to stay in touch with the community through events or putting together a workshop, I had that opportunity to switch from one place to the other. So like Chris says, I have some luck, but I also make some of my luck based off of the mm -hmm. things that I do. Yeah. I love this idea of compound interest on continuing to build, right? Where the, the building stacks up and it stacks up and it stacks up and you yes. can do more and more complex things all the time. We're finding the same thing with, with even our content on YouTube you know, to get a little bit meta right now. And, and it, it really does add the value to have that sort of library of things that you've built when you go to build the next thing, right? Yes. Um, and then I, I also want to just point out that uh, you you didn't just share Haystack, right? You literally connected directly with the company and you got to know the CEO of the company, Deep Set, that actually makes Haystack. Like you went to the level that I would personally recommend everybody try to go to as they're building, shipping, and sharing. You took building to the next level, shipping to the next level, sharing to the next level. Um, and so shout out to you for, for crushing it like that, Laura. I wanna, I wanna, if, if you're out there and you're feeling like, oh my God, Laura is a legend. I see why they call her that. Uh, we totally get it, okay? We've got another guest today that I'd like to welcome to the stage now. And his name is Pano Evangelou. Now, Pano, my man Pano, came from a much different background and now works as a senior AI engineer on Gen AI products. He has software development and like sort of nuts and bolts engineering background experience as well. He's an active member of our community, has been for quite some time, but it didn't happen overnight for you, Pano, did it? Tell us a little bit about your journey into the role you have now and where you started and versus where you actually are today as a senior AI engineer. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for hosting the introduction and uh, Chris and Sarah. Um, so that's true. I went through the entire grind of getting from a different trajectory into this field. I studied structural engineering. I did a couple of masters in a more mathematical background. And I worked for a few years as a developer. Then I had the bug of uh, machine learning because I did actually some primitive machine learning projects in my job. And I uh, grew in the statistics field. And then I was lucky, to use the term luck, to discover AI makerspace, and I went through a process of a few months of courses. I had to upscale my game in many fields, uh, including traditional machine learning, reinforcement learning, and finally, uh, Gen AI, where I focused. I saw that we all saw the turn to Gen AI, and with the courses that Chris and uh, Greg provided, um, I, I really upscaled that field and focused there. I built a lot with collaborators. I stayed as in the community 
as active as I could. And although this was not an, not an overnight thing, it was overnight because I had to stay up every uh, morning because I live in the Netherlands. I'm, I'm from Greece, if you can hear it in my accent. And I was following the courses. I was building with a lot of people from US. It was really exciting. And my job search started somewhere, uh, somewhere around last summer. And it took about two or three months. I did. I cast a really wide net, um, not really tailor made to my skills, but I wanted to go out there and figure out not only where I fit, but also what is the industry industry looking for, and focus on that particular skill set. Um, I got something like uh, ten interviews, and many of these interviews actually asked for uh, production grade skill sets, DevOps and knowing databases, knowing cloud systems. Having said that, the two jobs I landed since then uh, were uh, mainly because of the interview that I passed for the A foundational AI skills that I, I, I had. So a lot of questions about transformers and tokenizers, a lot of questions about orchestration tools like Langchain, like Langchain and of course, deploying them on the cloud. Um, so now I work as a senior engineer in, in, in Chapter. It's a German company, fully remote setting. We're building AI solutions to, um, as we say, redefine the workspace, um, enhance the business decision making, boost the work productivity, knowledge sharing, facilitating communication. And as, I, as I'm an AI engineer there, my role is to, um, not only reduce the cost of uh, AI and raise the performance, or at least make it certain because of the, uh, these systems are not deterministic, but also we need to stay up to the latest developments and shape the product sometimes because the developments are so rapid, they're all new, nobody knows what's coming in. And that's important to uh, be in a community. That's where it's important to be in a community. Uh, having said that, I also get a lot of requirements to, to do a lot of work in the DevOps part, and I'm currently growing there. Uh, we need to roll out this stuff before the next uh, company. We need to build fast. We need to uh, build scalable solutions. So I'm trying to grow in, in both uh, fields, stay up to date with AI, but at the same time, get to know more about um, DevOps systems and how to tape things together. We live in the era of API, uh, uh, of APIs, and it's important to know how to quickly bind them together and get a product rolled out. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. So it's so interesting to hear that even though you're in a senior AI engineer role now, you've got to continue to keep learning in both directions, right? You have to keep learning AI. You have to keep learning DevOps. You have to keep going, like. Do you see this ending for you, Pano? Uh, this is this is going to be part of the journey, is it not? Right. As, as you mentioned earlier, it's not about what degrees you have. It's about how you can adapt, learn the new solutions, and, and keep going. Uh, I also have self-learners in my uh, team, in my company, that are seniors. And we just need to stay up to date, shape the AI product, and keep keep um, staying on top of the newest abstractions that come out. Mm, mm. Speaking of staying on top of the newest abstractions that come out, Laura, let's go to you on this. I mean, how are you doing this today? You know, in your new role, right? You've got something new to learn, like you got to get become the expert on streaming now as well. Um, what's your advice and take for folks out there kind of feeling a little overwhelmed. Like, how do I stay up to date on all of this stuff that's happening? Um, what's your secret sauce there exactly? Well, I'm biased, obviously. I would say talk to you guys because you're really awesome at curating content. Um, no, I, th I think I think finding community is, is one of the ways to keep learning for sure. Because through community, you know, you can, you can get together and pick an area. I think right now what's happening in 2024 
And I think what's coming after is there's going to be specializations. You know, we when when this idea of data science blew up and machine learning models blew up, suddenly we have data ops and ML ops, and and we have all these specializations. And there's architecture design. So I think the same thing is 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 we're going to see something similar with LLMs and and building with the AI. Cybersecurity is going to be huge. I think this is an area that maybe we don't talk about enough, but I think I think fraud detection is going to be really important. So finding the first find what aspect of AI do you find interesting? Because ultimately that that inherent interest is what's going to keep driving you to learn. And then second, find the communities that that want to learn that together, either through meetups or events or even some of the courses that 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 you guys put together. Because when you're you're in the process with others, you get to put yourself out there and say, hey, I'm learning this too. I'm I'm building this too. And then also it's I think it's a it's it makes it a little easier to not feel as overwhelmed. In terms of how I do it, community is one. And then second, I just keep I keep I, I really like finding an area that I want to work on and just going really deep in it. So this year I'm going to be going really deep on streaming and I want to I want to um, incorporate streaming into what I learned last year. Last year I went really deep into mm -hmm. prompting LLMs and building LLM pipelines. And I, I felt comfortable taking a, a data source, whether it was uh, internet or PDFs or data tables, and then learning how to take that and transform it into vectors and then connect them to an LLM so I can have a rack system. That was that was my theme last year. This theme, this year I wanna I wanna focus more on the operational side, up managing the data that is fed to the LLM so I can bring those two together. So that's sort of my strategy. I pick an area, I go super deep, and then I, I combine it with what I what I, I, I have from last year or the previous years. Add it to the breadth. So we're seeing this yeah. sort of compound interest thing happen again. You know, yeah. you know, hey Wiz, we were chatting last night. You're like, I'm literally learning all the time, right? And you know, is this is this sort of something you actively think about, or does it just happen sort of uh, by proxy based on your sort of build, build, build mentality? I mean, uh, is this something you're 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 seeking and aiming at? What's your advice here for staying up to date? Yeah, like I so I for those of you who have known me long enough, like I give the same answer to this question every time, and I always will, right? Like. Uh, I find the best way to learn and the best way to keep learning is to find something that you want to build and then, uh, build until you can't build it. Right. And then, uh, instead of failing, right. Realize that what you, what you're doing is learning, not failing. Right. Uh, and learn how to do the part that you failed at and then keep doing that forever. Right. Like it's, I think the, you know, very much to the, the point of what, what Laura's talking to us about when it comes to this this year she's going deep on this this new use case right i mean that's you you kind of hit a wall at rag that in the wall for you could be a streaming use case right so it's now now you have to learn that and i think that's always what what keeps me motivated to to learn uh and keeps me uh literally needing to, to consist learn all the time is uh if you're trying to build something you will you'll hit a wall and then you'll you'll need to learn you know something about that thing um and then you can you can repeat that forever uh and the landscape right now is such that you, you know there is no catching up right you can't you can't mm. know everything about all things and so you i mean you just let yourself fall down the rabbit holes as they present themselves um but i i the reason that i bring it up in the context of building a project and then failing is I think if you just go down rabbit holes, cause you, it makes you feel good. Mm. Um, you lose kind of that tether to, to where this is actually applicable or how you can leverage this to create value. So it's important to tie, tie these rabbit holes back into something that does a thing. Um, because ultimately that's your company is going to ask you to do things, right? Like wherever you work, your job, I wish the job could just be learning stuff uh, and then knowing lots of things, right? That'd be dope. But unfortunately, just not not uh, not an industry relevant, uh, you know, role. Uh, but knowing stuff and being able to learn new things, hypercritical today. Yeah. As we've heard from Pano, as we've heard from Laura, as we'll hear from anyone working in the space, uh, being flexible and being able to learn quickly new things 
is is beyond critical uh, at, right. at this at this moment in time. That's right, and and I think it's sort of this this being able to say, hey, listen, I don't know this thing. I need to go learn this thing, right? That that's kind of where it starts, right? Pano, you talked a little bit earlier. You said I, I got to learn DevOps. What was your I don't know moment that led you to DevOps exactly? Um, it was when our uh, agile sprint board was filling up with DevOps um, DevOps tasks, and I realized that. I need to learn this. And actually I was feeling the lack of being able to uh, be autonomous in deploying production grade systems. I already knew that and it was time that I would cover it. Uh, it's, it's, it has so many walls to hit there. Like Chris mentioned, uh, these are walls that everyone will see in front of them and we have to just uh, break through. That's right. That's right. It's the nature of the edge. And I think sort of, you know, if we can look for those, I don't know moments, we can figure out what we need to learn next. That can lead us to what we need to build next and ultimately to ship and share next. I want to, yeah, go ahead. Pana. If I can add one more thing, I, I agree completely with Lara and Chris. Uh, you have to find something to focus on. Don't get distracted by all the hype that comes out every day. Keep an eye but stay focused on what you are going to learn and uh, make build a system uh, to compound this. Every day working on uh, just an hour or something is mm. hugely compounding, makes a real difference. That's right, that's right. So Wiz, out of curiosity, what are you I don't knowing about right now? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a tough question. It's kind of like everything. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's a meta layer to to the AI engineering uh, space that I think I don't understand well enough yet uh, that I want to understand better. So it you know we 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 can talk about it through like the lens of agents or or you mm. know uh, something like that. But it's more like uh, as we move forward and we discover the use cases that. Uh, you know, LLM applications or LLM based applications are strong, right? How do we then interject those into existing stacks? It's not something that's clear to me yet because we haven't kind of solved the use cases, but we are in some way solving some of the use cases, like like chat to your PDF, you know, or, or chat to your doc, right? Your text is, uh, it's like reasonably, figured out you know for for the most part we can we can get that uh we can get that done we we know like what kinds of models you need you know how to use them everything like this but uh i don't know how those are going to fit back into the the decades of tech stack that we already have uh but they will at some point uh is is what it seems like so i i want to learn more about that yeah. um and that's a you know again welcome to the 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 AI space, right? I mean, yeah, there's a yeah, paper yeah. on everything that you could ever imagine coming out every six minutes. So, uh, I mean, Pano uh, links papers in the in in our community that is from the interest that Pano has. I've never seen them or heard of them because they're just not in the space that I've wormed my way into, right? So it's like, um, you know, everything you could want. And I think I think just to repeat again, maybe we'll we'll just say it every single time each of us speaks, but uh, not getting distracted is the part that is tough and i think uh you know that's why it's good to have the community so you have other people who can not get distracted but still let you know what's up you know yeah 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 so i mean yours is pretty meta whiz i think uh, expectedly so um laura it seems like you're on this real-time streaming pano it seems like you're on devops and there's not really like uh you know an answer of what to study next i mean I'm kind of curious to get everybody's take. Let's start with Laura on this. There's a lot of this um, kind of like, oh, you should be using ChatGPT every day. You should be, you know, you should be, uh, you should be using these AI tools all the time. This is the best way to get into it. Rather, we're hearing now, like you probably know if you're kind of working towards becoming an AI engineer, what you need to learn next. You probably know this already, even if you don't want to look at it and confront it. Um, Laura, would you sort of advise people to kind of make sure they're using AI tools every day or to rather kind of really sit down and be honest with themselves when it comes to business and data science and software engineering 
where their gaps are and start filling those in. I think the second for sure. Um, yeah. I think the second for sure, because I mean, there's there's always going to be cool tools for a specific purpose, and we don't have time to learn all of them or to use all of them all the time. I think I, I resonate a lot with what with Chris said on what is the value that it provides. What is the value and that the cost, right? Because there's also a cost to using them. There's always a cost as well. So sitting down and thinking first, what is my use case? What are the tools that could solve my use case? What do they give me and how much do they cost me? And is the benefit bigger than the cost? Um, I think those, those are good questions to sit down and, and think about. Um, once once you narrow down those questions, and then yeah, of course, use the tools. If if the tool fits the job and it's it's serving a purpose, then and it's not it's it's not costing more than you can bear, then by all means use it every day. Get better at it, and because more tools are going to come tomorrow, and the next month, and next year, there's always going to be new new cool tools to use. And I I I think within the space specifically, we're always getting mind blown by the new update. And the new, the new shiny toy. Like this year, we saw Sora. <laughs> Last year, we were mind blown by ChatGPT. This year, it was Sora. <laughs> so next year, there's going to be more, more amazing things. So it's always, I think there's always, we we can be for certain sure there's going to be more tools coming down the pipeline. Yeah, what a great example. Yeah, yeah. Sora is way sexier than DevOps or real time streaming. Everybody, and it's important to sort of align what you're going to learn next with exactly what it is you're aiming at. Um, oh, I want to go ahead and, and actually just go straight to some of the Q&A in the Slido now, and maybe we can address some of these for everybody. If you've got additional questions you'd like to ask any of our guests today, throw them in the Slido. If you, got see, if you see things you'd like to see definitely answered, then thumbs up those questions. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about hiring partners, essentially the best way to interact with our hiring partners is you get certified in our AI engineering bootcamp and you become a certified AI engineer through us. That's going to allow us to make a direct introduction and get you in front of multiple hiring partners that always have job availability and job openings that they're working on filling. So that, that's the short answer. Um, the way you contact Maruti is essentially through AI Makerspace. Of course, you can reach out to him directly on LinkedIn as well if you've got an awesome project you've built that you're ready to talk about. Um, so let's talk about I, this question from Claudio. Can you discuss the generative AI learning path? This is something that we try to outline nicely in our AI engineering bootcamp, but I want to kind of go, let's start with Pano on this one. I mean, if you had to do it all over again, my man, what did it take you? Nine months, 12 months, something like that. Um, where would you recommend somebody that's at the beginning of their journey start and how to move through it exactly? Right. Good question. Um, I think if I started off uh, fresh, I would directly for Gen AI, I wouldn't go much into traditional ML and data science. I would just straightforward do, go into two things, uh, prompting and all the or all the frameworks around it, like Langchain. And second, learning the foundation, uh, how a transformer is built, how to use hugging face libraries. Once I knew that, and that would take me maybe uh, two months, I also deploy some easy, do some easy deployments to on hugging face to see how these things actually roll out then I would uh, directly would start looking for a job and see what's uh, needed there, what's more needed there. And I think then you can build up your software engineering skills more slowly like I did, but for sure start from pure Gen AI and build your way forward. Mm. Laura, what do you think? What, what would you recommend and what do you recommend to folks in, in your communities trying to, trying to learn and get up to speed? Um, what's the best path, in your opinion? Uh, I think getting familiar with the key concepts uh, and the, the key workflows. Get familiar with what are the key steps in something like an indexing pipeline? What are the key components in it? 
what is the difference between a retriever pipeline and an indexing pipeline? And I think starting from concepts and getting familiar with the concepts make it a lot easier to translate into building once you start to play with models from hugging phase or with, with frameworks to build these pipelines together. Um, a lot of the times, many assumptions are within these tools and not having the concepts makes it impossible <laughs> to, to build things together and understand what's going wrong. So start with the foundational concepts and then start mapping concept to how the framework works to build things from there. Very nice, very nice. Um, Wiz, Pato mentioned the transformer, right? He mentioned it after figuring out how to build some kind of applications and some infrastructure. It seems like there's this kind of moving up we have to learn, this sort of like Lego blocks of applications with front end and back end and infrastructure tools like Langchain or Llama Index and RAG and agents. And, and then there's also like the deep down into the LLMs. I mean, when you think about order of operations and uh, feel free anybody in the panel here jump in on this because this is maybe one of the most hotly debated topics that we have in our community and in our courses uh, what's your recommendation for learning path linear like algorithmically single collab notebook codable learning path what would you recommend to people as they get started from scratch? Yes, uh, I think, you know, you've got to start where everyone starts, right? Playing with the AI uh, is a key part of the learning process, right? Chat GPT, learning how to communicate with the with the AI, right? Like that's that that's a uh, that's a, the best place to start, right? It, once you have a feel for how it works, how it responds, how it uh, yada, 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 I think you're going to be able to much easily, much more easily understand how your application is going to come together. Next, I think the, the next step is, you know, build some kind of interactive tool that leverages that thing without a framework, just using Python, right? Just using whatever JavaScript, what, it doesn't matter, using whatever thing that you're, you're in love with. And then from there, start moving into frameworks. Once you've got frameworks, you will eventually hit a wall and that wall will be, but it's not producing exactly what I want all the time or, or, or what it's producing is not the thing that I need it to produce. And at that point, I think is when you're going to want to do as Pano suggested and start moving into, you don't got to dive all the way down to, you know, the attention mechanism. But at least into like, so what, what is the transformer model doing? What's an LLM behind the scenes? What, what are its outputs really? I mean, we, I get it. it. We get text back, but there must be something right before text that's important, right? And there is. And so learning about that can be crucial to understanding how to guide the generation that you're getting, how to change the generation and, and on and on and on, right? So I do think that the learning path will take you to at least surface level learning the transformer. Um, it, it, even if you don't have to get deep into the math, I think you're, you will get there. You get there sooner than you think. And then once you get there, you know, okay, well, the R and rag, right? I mean, we talk, we meme about it a lot, but it's like a huge space. It's, it's, it's in fact impossibly large, right? It's growing at the same rate as the models are growing. So, so how do we actually retrieve the data we want, right? And I think at that point is when you're going to want to specialize into one of these subsections. Uh, so you're going to want to sub uh, specialize into maybe the retrieval half of the stack, maybe the model half of the stack, maybe the operations part of the stack, right? Um, but getting that kind of breadth, getting the hands on, uh, you know, learning how to communicate with these models. An earlier question was talking about should you use chat gpt or tools like it every day if you want to be good in ai engineering and i'm gonna i'm just gonna you know without comment emphatically say yes um we we've been learning to communicate with each other as human beings for since we could talk right even even a little bit before we could talk to be honest with you um 
why why would it be different for this AI thing, right? Why would it be different for these models, right? We, there's no way after two years, three years, that we've mastered communication with these uh, semi or intelligent seeming systems. And I think talking to them, chatting with them, right, uh, is a way to improve your your ability to communicate. And part of what you do as an AI engineer is you communicate with these systems, even if it's a little weird, you, you know, even if it's not uh, traditional human communication, it is still, you've got to ask it to do a thing and then it's got to do the thing, right? Like that is, I won't, I won't go on any, any longer than that. That's I'll right. let, <laughs> let the others chime in, but that's, that's, that's where I'm feeling about all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So driving the car versus understanding how to build the car yeah. um, is, is kind of the, the key here, right? Make sure that's you know right. how to drive it. Then if you really want to get into the weeds, go for it. Um, you know, uh, one minute Pano on transformers, uh, what role do they play for you? And are you interested in continuing to learn about them? And then we'll go to Laura on transformers for our final question. Right. Uh, that's what actually got me my job, uh, a lot good knowledge of transformers and tokenizers. I was asked a lot about how to use the hugging face library. Of course, now we're going to more agentic systems. Maybe this is not so relevant, but for me, uh, knowing the underlying structure is really, really important. Knowing the foundation, I can evaluate models. I can evaluate the size of models. I know what embeddings are and how they're useful to rag systems. Uh, that's shortly. Yeah, yeah. In one minute. Laura, transformers, uh, what role do they play for you? And how do you look at them moving forward? I think for me, uh, it was very important to understand their role. I focused. I didn't go deep into transformers. I focused more on the retriever and indexing pipelines. So applying the model. What was very important for me was understanding how their architectures impact their use case. And uh, I think understanding the overall structure for me, I think I took more of a general overview of transformers as opposed to more in depth. But for me, getting a broad overview of how those systems work and and why choosing a specific type of transform architecture helped me achieve my goal. I think one of the things that's really interesting when it comes to building pipelines is this idea of experimenting and choosing the right model from Hugging Face or any other provider is really critical, right? It's very important as, as part of your decision tree, the cost, the latency, how it was trained, but also the architecture itself. So I would, I'd say for me, having a, an understanding of the function that the model performs, what are some of the advantages versus disadvantages, uh, and how that's going to impact a retriever indexing pipeline system. I think that, that was my focus, not so much going in depth. Mm, nice. Okay. Okay. And there's one more question I've just got to ask with this panel. It's, and even though we'll probably go a little bit over time here, but how can we find remote outside of the US AI engineering jobs? So I'm actually the only one on this panel located in the U.S. So let's just go around the horn here for top level thoughts. Pana, let's kick it off with you. You're all the way across the pond. Uh, tell us a little bit about the experience over there and maybe provide any sort of advice for folks around the world. Um, I, I had two, two remote jobs, uh, both of them not in the U.S., both of them in European uh, companies. European companies are not that uh, evolved in the fully remote setting, so that's not going to help you much, um, but they are growing towards that point, uh, the fully remote. For US jobs, um, most of my interviews were, were with European companies, so I would pass it to someone else. Um, it was already tough staying overnight for the courses. Um, maybe Laura. Yeah, yeah. Laura, let's go to you. Um, you're in Canada. You're on the west <laughs> coast of North America here. Um, what are you finding this to be like job searching outside of the U.S.? So when you say outside of the U.S., you mean me outside of the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if, if folks are sort of feeling like they have to be in the U.S. to get a job, oh. or they're feeling like, you know, maybe maybe that's their dream to land a remote job working for a based company, what would your advice be for them? Yeah, I, I, I think this is the piece where, again, sharing is very important and curating your presence is very important because being outside of the U.S. means you can't meet people physically 
as easily, right? So this means that you have to be very intentional about what you write, how you write it, and what kind of content you are known for, whether you're you're the type of person who is an engineer or the type of person who, who builds systems or design systems or the type of person who deploys systems. Um, so first, identifying what your area is. And I think it's very important that it's it's clearly communicated to others what that area is and what you're interested in and what value you can provide. Because it, it, it makes it a lot easier for people searching who are open to working with others outside of the US to say, hey, this person seems to fit very well what we're looking for. So place time curating that online presence and the kind of content that you are known for. Mm, I love that. Content, 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 content. Um, Wiz, what's your take? I know you're up in Toronto. It's basically the US, but you know, like what what, what are you seeing in terms of folks looking for remote jobs around the world? Yeah, I mean Laura Laura already said it all. Uh yeah. Pano spoke to the situation in Europe. Uh there there's a magic of being from not in the States <laughs> to getting a remote job in the States, which is that everywhere is cheaper than the States, right? So uh, I mean, the, the, the amount of cash that you get relative to your, uh, your country's, uh, you know, uh, salaries is probably going to be easier to hit, uh, in terms of, you know, your comfortable and cost of living, um, which is fantastic. And, uh, also right now people just want talent and they're willing to take remote people to get it like it's it's just the case that if you are someone who is building actively shipping actively sharing actively uh you're, you're just doing so much of the right things that it's it's like they're they're going to help you uh you know reach those uh reach those heights you're looking to reach because you have uh, talent in an area that that very few people do. I, I know it's. I we I always try to refocus on this. And a, a, another community member, Juan, also says this a lot, right? Um, when it's when it comes to AI, because we exist in this sphere of people who care deeply about this thing, it can become the case that you believe a lot of this is common knowledge right? That everybody knows RAG, everybody knows LLMs. But like, if you talk to almost everybody, right? They have no idea what you're talking about ever. And I'm not talking about almost everyone from like just people on the street, but businesses, right? Like people who run businesses. AI is very popular in the community of AI, right? LLMs very popular in our community, but outside of it, people are still learning the basics, right? People are still learning about what chat GBT is. And I think that's something to keep in mind, right? That, you know, reaching a certain level of knowledge might feel uh, like you're behind, you know, the people who are the most knowledgeable in this space. But I mean, you're right behind the people who are most knowledgeable about this thing on earth. That's pretty good, right? Like you're, that's a, that's a good level of knowledge to strive for. So <laughs> When you're like, oh, I'm like 15% behind, you know, Andre Karpathy on AI. It's like, well, yeah, but like there's there's one of him. So it's not so bad. You know, like at least six people need to hire that kind of guy. So you're good, bro. You know, like uh, I, I would think of it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I just want to sort of triple down on everything that we heard from the panelists just now. I mean, if you are trying to crack this nut and get that job, you have got to build your online presence. And it starts by sharing stuff you've built. That's the content that when somebody makes it to your profile, you can talk about driving them there later. This is after they make it there. They see somebody that's learning that's building, that's shipping, that's sharing, and fundamentally that's teaching, just like they'll have to do on their team. You know, I was talking to a large defense contractor recently, and the CTO told me that the CEO still had no idea what chat GPT was. This is the state of affairs in many large bureaucracies in the US today. This is the kind of people that are running these companies. They still often have no idea what's going on with AI. There's a lot of opportunity for you to help. And if you can offer yourself at a lower cost than the next person, 
then that's a competitive advantage too. If you want to start getting on the path, well, we've got a community for you and you should think about jumping into our Discord today. We have weekly meetups that will actually help you get to your dreams and achieve your goals. And uh, the last thing before we wrap the panel, Wiz, I believe you uh, have one thing to share with everybody. Yeah. Hey, what's up? We're on YouTube. Uh, this is the obligatory. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell. You know, it's uh, I listen. I, it's fun because uh, we we do care about the YouTube community. We do care about uh, YouTube. It's an awesome platform to be able to deliver events on. And uh, when you do those things, it helps us uh, know what you're interested in, know what we should keep doing. Uh, and, uh, of course, it helps you know when we go live, which is every Wednesday uh, around this time. And by around, I mean exactly this time. So, <laughs> and, uh, so like it's up. Laura, how can they get in contact with you? How can we stay in touch with you? I'm very happy to connect on LinkedIn and on GitHub. Uh, if you have my, I, I don't know, I can post my link on the YouTube comments yeah. and then people can, can add me. I can also post my GitHub repository if you want to collaborate. If I think I'm very eager right now to build projects that mix real-time analytics with AI. So if, if you have a use case, if there's something that you say, hey, like I have a rack system that has some streaming data, think stocks, think news, think internet searches, anything you think that changes in real time, please chat with me. I, I'm really curious to build some of those real time rack systems. Mm, collab with Laura the Legend yeah. coming soon. Pano, how can everybody stay in touch with you and follow what you're doing? Right, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm sharing the my address right now. and. Also, we'll uh, share my GitHub. Also, in the AI Makerspace community. That's right. If you find yourself you in the Netherlands, you. hit up Pano. If you find yourself right. in uh, Vancouver, hit up Laura. Or if you're in Toronto, hit up The Wiz. If you find yourself to Southwestern Ohio, hit me up. That's uh, a wrap. Thanks so much, guys, for joining us for the panel today. It's time to close up the event. Um, if you're going and looking for ways to get started now. You can start for free. You can start learning about LM application development and accelerating it directly on GitHub. We open sourced our LLM Ops course from last August, and that's worth checking out. It's a great starting point. It's zero cost, and you can leave comments and ask questions on YouTube directly and get them answered. If you want to just quadruple down and super accelerate, get certified, get access to hiring partners, check out our AI engineering bootcamp. We just launched cohort two, but cohort three is going to be coming up in May. And that one's going to be a banger. Well, we've taken enough of your time for today. So we really do appreciate you spending our Wednesdays with us live on YouTube. If you have any feedback on today's event, we know it was a little bit different than the typical concepts and code event. Let us know what you thought, how we can improve this kind of job seeker slash hiring event in the future. And until next time, as we heard so many times today, keep building, shipping, and sharing. And you know we will be doing the same. We'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone.